covered. But <laughs> I really like that cupboard. It is very cute. But If I turned my camera and saw my work environment. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm literally like shoved into the corner where Ben's work desk is now. And there's, this is a space built for a seven-year-old. <laughs> It is seven o'clock. I'm gonna go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order. It is Thursday, October 15th, and this is tonight's school board meeting. May I please have the attendance? Sure. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yeah. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Ms. Layton, is your microphone working? Yes, sorry, my computer just froze. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Here. Okay. And if you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Okay. Um, we have no attendees, so I'm going to pause for one quick moment to see if there's any public comment on tonight's agenda. All right. Seeing none. Moving into new business, um, I'm going to go ahead and bundle 6.1.1, the high school donation, 6.1.2, the middle school donation. 6.1.3, Wentworth School Donation, 6.1.4, Eight Corners, 6.1.5, Blue Point, and 6.1.6, .6, Pleasant Hill. These are all um, donations from the Hannaford Health School Program for a grand total of $19,234. Um, the totals are on the screen. This is incredibly generous. Um, it is for two years. It was the 1919 and 19. 1920 um, donations that folks had um, given at Hannaford. And with that, is there a motion to approve? Oh. Second. Second. Yeah. Okay, any discussion? I just wanted to clarify, Leanne, is this the, um, the thing you put your receipt in the little area for each school? Yes. That's what I yeah, thought. That's yeah, what those that's are. Great. All right. I believe we're ready to vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. And thank you, Hennifer. Thank you. All right, 6.2. Um, I had sent these out, I believe earlier this week. Um, they also would have been posted onto the website. The MSMA um, resolutions for the delegate assembly, which is taking place on October 29th. There are four um, resolutions and we actually do need to approve these so that we can direct our delegate um, on how they should be representing Scarborough at the meeting. Um, just as the question, as much as I really don't want to read them, I probably should read them into record. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and make it so. The first one is development of a distance learning plan. The coronavirus pandemic upended classroom instruction in school districts and revealed both positives and shortcomings in our ability to do distance learning. What was implemented by necessity should now be improved by design. Distance learning should not be should not just be the fallback in a crisis, but rather used to provide equitable learning opportunities to all Maine students regardless of their location. The Maine School Boards Association calls for a plan that addresses professional development for teachers, assessment of devices, high quality connectivity in all places, all parts of the state, 
development of online curriculum appropriate to age groups, and intentional use of online learning to enhance curriculum and expand learning opportunities for all students. Funding for online learning should be part of the school funding formula. MSBA will actively participate in the development and implementation of such a plan. The rationale behind this, our experience with distance learning when schools were required to shut down because of COVID and what we will learn as we reopen schools under hybrid models could help make us could help us make better use of technology to support instruction and broaden curriculum options for all students. Distance learning can supplement in-person instruction and also support subject areas where there is a teacher shortage. That coupled with increased broadband access is key to educational equity for Maine students. So that's the first resolution. And are we gonna vote on them separately? In, in the past, we've had different responses for different resolutions. Yes. Um, so I actually was going to open this up for motion um, to accept as read. So moved. And then we can just, thank you. Second? Oh, second, sorry. Okay. And then discussion on this. And Nick, your hand is up. Yep. Um, so when I read this, uh, when, it, when it was sent out a few days ago, I, I, I was thrilled because I've been saying this all along within my professional arena, and I know I've said it at least once here in our school board meetings, the toothpaste is out of the tube with this. And it's just so exciting to see public education embracing some of the technologies that really diversify um, the curriculum, what we can offer, how students can access information asynchronously, synchronously, and all of those fabulous terms we've thrown around now for, since March. Um, it, it's just really exciting to see MSMA and hopefully our, our collective, respective collective bargaining bodies across the state at all the levels, all the way up through their public universities and community colleges, um, start to embrace and see the real benefits to bringing technology into not just the classroom, but into everything that goes into preparing for the classroom, virtual or physical. So I, I couldn't have been more excited to read that first one. It got me energized for the other three. Not that they're not always thrilling things to read and experience, um, but this year, that being the first one, I thought was so timely and just really on top of it. So bravo, MSMA. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I agree with Nick. I guess my only um, question would be s sort of what this commits us as a district to. Um, because I, I think everything in there is reasonable and things that we should fight for. The only thing that I think is like maybe challenging, which doesn't mean it shouldn't be in there or slightly maybe even outside of the scope of our role would be the broadband. So I don't know, like maybe you can just, like this is really like all we're doing is approving that this is something that uh, we're going to endeavor to do and support over the next year, right? Like it's not like a commitment or anything like that. Um, it in a way is a commitment that we would be in support of um, MSMA pushing for this through legislation. Um, okay. Just to piggyback on that a little bit, I did have a huge concern about the broadband. Um, I believe that broadband is absolutely necessary. I don't believe it should be coming out of funding for the schools. That pie is so small already. And to take any money away from that really gives me pause. I think that's something that the state needs to invest in um, for the schools, for businesses, for the health of our, of our state in general. Um, so I'm really concerned about the schools taking the lead charge. I was also really concerned about the EPS impacts. Um, again, if we're looking at how we're going to fund this, if we're taking more money out of districts, how is that going to work? How is that gonna impact us? Um, Already, we're pretty low on where we are with receiving money from the state. I'd hate to lose more money to build up um, this repository. So I'm hoping that maybe there's an option for some of the CRF funding to support this and not from our EPS formula. Um, Kristen? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Leanne, can I just finish sorry. my thought oh, on that? I'm so no, sorry, I, sir. I thought I you were done and I jumped in. <laughs> No, no worries. Um, I, yeah, so I, I would say conceptually in theory, I absolutely support this. I think maybe that's just something for whoever the delegate is just to have a conversation about and confirm like where funding for something like that would come from. Cause I agree with your point, but that's it. 
Kristen. Yep, I agree with what you said. I have concerns about how this affects the funding formula. I think also I sort of fundamentally disagree with this. I don't know that we have enough information yet to say that online distance learning is beneficial for all of our students. I personally would argue at this point in time, I think distance learning should be a crisis only situation for our K-5 students. You know, what that means for other parts of the state and other age groups, I don't know, but I just, I'm not convinced yet that this is the best choice for our students. It may turn out to be, but I don't know that we have that evidence yet. Thank you. Thank you. April? So I was the delegate last year. Um, and if no one else is interested in being the delegate, I will happily do it again this year. That being said, if someone else wants the experience, um, I would certainly encourage other people to, to give it a go. It was definitely a learning experience to see um, how the parliamentary procedure plays out. Um, what I don't want us as a board to do, and I think we kind of got bogged down by this last year too, is get too far into the weeds unless we as a board want to propose a specific amendment um, to any of these because for us it's good to have these discussions and I will say as the delegate so many amendments were made last year that I actually voted against some of the propositions in the end because I felt like they were changed so far beyond what we had agreed and talked about as a board that they no longer fit um, necessarily what we had discussed. So I think it's really good to have a robust conversation about each of these because the delegate, whoever it is, will be able to use this conversation to apply it to whatever may change um, in terms of wording or amendments that come forward on the day that um, these get presented. That being said, um, I don't think that these are intended to be implemented or that board should be perceiving these as something that we need to implement. Basically, we are saying as a as a division of all of the school boards in Maine, we are in support of the larger body advocating for these things at the state level. So that's important to keep perspective on that too, I think. Thank you. Hillary? Um, I, I was going to mention a couple of the things that April said that um, this isn't a directive for our board. It's more that, you know, the MSBA is similar to we are what we are. You know, I can't go out and say this is what I want the board to support. The board has to make that decision on their own. So in the same way, that's what those delegates are doing. They're voting on whether the MSBA um, will proceed with, you know, following up on these resolutions or not. When I was the delegate, there were several of them that didn't pass and they, you know, and then they, they're not their resolutions anymore. Um, I also just wanted to add to what April said, if there is an amendment, um, we, you, um, we can submit it early enough so that um, other, other boards will have that before the day of. So, Sometimes you do get day of amendments and that can be really tricky, but a lot of times they'll come in before that and then you have a chance to look at them earlier. Um, so besides that, I mean, I, I do agree with Nick, you know, like this is out there and I think that to not use the technology um, that that we have figured out, you know, we're, we basically have kind of figured it out on the go and to, and to not use it doesn't feel right, but, um, because I think it is a tool, but my concern is that when it becomes more than a tool and becomes the primary method of instruction, that's, you know, what I kind of agree with Kristen on. That's not, I mean, as far as I can tell, just from the limited experience we've had with it so far, that's not an ideal situation for students or teachers. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess, I guess I just argued myself. So I guess I guess my point is that if it's if we're using it as a tool for instruction, that's one thing, and I think that's valuable. But if we're using it for instruction, like full stop, I I don't think that that's in the best interests of our 
of our students or teachers. Can I just add like a quick bit on, on what she said? Sure. All I want to say is that I think Hillary hit on the nose, and I, and I apologize if I didn't say this for well, but I view this as expanding the palette that's available to our educators. There are some things that are always going to be optimized in the classroom, um, but I, I view this as just, just making a bigger tool belt. There's just more options and more different ways to engage with students. And so it doesn't kind of turn us into the Jetsons necessarily, but it gives us just a bigger uh, a palette of, of, of tools to use for our students. That, that's how I see it. Kristen? Yep, I agree. I agree with what both Nick and Hillary have said that it is a tool that we should definitely keep at our disposal. I think what concerns me about this resolution is it does feel it does feel like this is going to become a mode of instruction. And that's it in it's we're now talking about funding and how to me, it's a little bit too open. How much funding are we talking about at the expense of what? When we talk about developing an online curriculum, who's doing that? What control does each local district have in that? I think I just have, there are so many assumptions and too many, I think questions for me to know how hard the MSBA is going to push for this and how many resources are gonna to go to this. Oh, no, no, no. Alicia? Thank you. Uh, I think for me, the um, I've heard good points made by all of you. Um, I do have some concerns. It, it, I think that we have seen in the past when there are new uh, developments focused in um, Augusta, we, we lose some of our local control and um, maybe things expand in a way that is not intended. I would obviously want to support equitable access to education. Um, I would want to support the use of technology when necessary in times of a crisis like this. Um, I think we've learned pretty dramatically that our students require socialization um, and that's a huge part of the educational process. There are parts of the um, proposal that concern me that they're considering one of the statements that I, I don't like is um, distance learning can supplement in-person instruction and support substance subject areas when there's a teacher shortage. So to me, it seems like they're contemplating a future if they are unable to fully staff a classroom that they might use distance learning as an alternative. That's not something on its face I would support. And that's the type of expansion that I would be concerned about. Um, there's also been discussion in the community about um, snow days and using technology for snow days. And that was prior to COVID. Um, and for me, that's always been a concern because I feel like that has been a convenience aspect for parents and their vacation plans and um, child care issues and teachers who maybe may find um, sort of the best of both worlds. And, it, and to me, it is somewhat of a limitation of, of our educational opportunities for our students. And so um, I, I support it in theory, but with hesitancy, because I, I worry about what support could mean if, if that's sort of dragged out into other areas that we may not anticipate. Thank you. Hillary? Um, I was just thought, I thought it might be valuable to hear what Diane and Sandy think about this resolution um, from the perspective of an administrator. I, I think Alicia would kind of summarize what I would have to say. I think there's a balance with all of this. And um, while it can be an opportunity to push learning further, uh, I do worry about the socialization. 
Um, so I think it's like anything, there's no magic bullet in any classroom. And um, I would look at this as one opportunity, one tool that we could use, and certainly it has great value. But I do worry about the balance, and uh, that, that's kind of where I land on this whole thing. Yeah, and for me, as I read it, I guess the key word that, that I picked out was to supplement. Um, and supplementing instruction is really different than supplanting instruction or replacing what we have. And so, you know, that was the piece that I focused on. And, and I know how focused the state has been in making sure that we have funds available, the CRF funds, so that a lot of what was written in um, there, we have been able to expend funds on um, without digging into EPS or our general budget. But this specifically says that it would be part of EPS. Yeah. I guess what I would say to that is that I think so many school districts have been afforded um, the opportunity to really have some significant funding that many of the things that are listed in this particular resolution um, will have been achieved already. So it's a it's an interesting thing, right? Like, I think like when I think about the broadband thing, I think about all of the concerns this spring that happened in regards to Northern Maine and people not having access and all of the work that was done and the initiatives brought forward to try to equalize that um, for folks in that part of the state. Um, I know locally in terms of access, um, you know, we have secured you know, more than 50 hotspots, and we have been matching those up as we need to for families that didn't have the access that they need currently um, to support the hybrid model that we have. Um, and so we've been able to do that within um, what we have available. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, actually, what, what Diane said leads, leads directly into what I was going to say, which is that maybe a suggestion for our for our delegate, whether it's April or another eager um, member of the of the board, would be to kind of gain some clarity in the group and in the conversation around funding. Because one of the things that I was thinking about as Kristen was talking is that, like so many things in nonprofit organizations, whether it's education or not, you get a grant, you get some seed money. In this case, it came through COVID. It allowed a lot of districts to do things they couldn't have afforded to do, um, to have mobile hotspots, to buy technology, to kind of bring things up to date in a way. But of course, one thing we always have to think about is when the grant money dries up or God willing, when COVID goes away, how do we continue funding that type of support? How do we continue to support technological integration now that everybody's had a taste of it? And as we use it as a supplement, like, like Diane said, there's still an added cost to that that's going to dry up when the money and the focus goes off COVID and the pandemic. So it would be a great topic of conversation, you know, with the group at MSMA conference to say, you know, is the idea here to get MSMA in, in, the, in the legislature really lobbying and pushing for expanding the pie and growing some more permanent funding to support this type of, of modality broadening. Because once that money's gone, once COVID's gone, thank, hopefully, we won't need this type of relief money. And so we'll need to find that funding somewhere else. Um, thank you. And that really was what I was trying to get across. And Sarah, again, I apologize for really just jumping in the middle of your statement. Um, so based on what we have, is there a motion to accept as written? So moved. Yeah. Second. Um, we've had the discussion. Is there any adjustment or 
April, do you have enough based on the conversation to feel confident going into um, the assembly? I was actually going to ask you, um, I couldn't remember based on last year, whether we voted to authorize a delegate to make a vote or whether, and, and then we also voted on each individual, um, what are they called? Resolution. Is that what we, we did? did? We, we need to vote on each individual one. We need to vote on each individual one. And then coming up later under appointments will be where um, we actually are going to name our delegate. I just sort of jumped so a little I, bit because you've kindly gone through. <laughs> <laughs> so I've taken a lot of notes um, and I feel like I could represent the board if amendments are made based on our discussion uh, specifically concerning the funding. Um, I have reservations about um, supporting this as written, but I would be very surprised to be honest if this one goes through as written. And so part of me feels like if you, uh, if you support the spirit of what the um, resolution is suggesting, then we'll see how this plays out. And um, I anticipate that there will probably be at least one amendment, if not more than one. I agree completely with that. So should, I mean, if we're so on the fence about those specific areas, should we make an amendment or are we just gonna assume somebody else will? I think we can make the amendment. Um, I actually, that's where I was kind of opening this that if somebody wants to make one, I think we, this is the time to do so. I'll, I'll make the amendment. Thank you, Alicia. Or what I propose as an amendment, I guess. Um, distance learning should be used to supplement traditional instruction. Oops, I'm sorry, I move, I move to amend the resolution to include a statement that says distance learning should be used to supplement traditional instruction to provide for equitable opportunities for instruction and in times of emergency. You're looking at the third sentence. I was just thinking of an addition oh. that would that would um, maybe capture some of the concerns that we have spoken about. Could someone read the resolution the, as a whole? Because I, I don't have it in front of me. I, I think the sentence will, Leanne read it earlier. I think the sentence we're talking about is the third one. Because I think Matt, that we can, make, we can make a quick, so I'll read it as it's written. Distance learning should, distance learning should not just be a fallback in a crisis, but rather used to provide equitable learning opportunities to all Maine students, regardless of their location. I think we could add like a clause in the middle of this and instead say, distance learning should not be just a fallback in a crisis, but used to supplement um, traditional, but, but also used to supplement, regularly supplement traditional classroom modalities and provide equitable learning opportunities to all Maine students, regardless of their location. So just add a piece in there about the supplement piece. I think that there's a motion on the floor that either- oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It needs to either be seconded or not. Oh. Can you say it again, Alicia? Did somebody write it down? Because <laughs> I don't know that I can. Um, I wasn't able to write fast enough. I'm sorry. I, I'll try to. I, I think that the sentence that I proposed was that distance learning shall not be used to replace traditional classroom instruction, but that's not how I said it, but um but to supplement for for um equitable opportunity equitable instruction opportunities and in times of emergency second second any discussion so what i'll do 
Oh, sorry. I was just going to start discussing. <laughs> Go for it. So what I'll do is um, I mark the minutes of when this conversation started. So I, as the, if I do get chosen as delegate, I can either share my notes or I, and I'll go through and rewatch Alicia and capture what you said um, and make sure that I type it up and I'll share it with the board before I send it to um, MSMA for the amendment. Hillary? I'm just looking like I actually I mean so I guess I'm gonna I'm probably gonna vote no on Alicia's amendment only because I think if we do it the way Nick had proposed it's much more clear um, by just adding like a small segment into that sentence and then I guess my question is I'm more concerned honestly, with the funding. So um, is that a separate amendment or are we amending the entire resolution this one time? I think that we need to vote on this amendment and then you can make another amendment or Nick can, or the two of you can combine it um, to include both pieces. Is that right, Leanne? Correct. Is it helpful for me to share this on the screen like this? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to be clear that an amendment can encapsulate both pieces that that it doesn't have to be just like one section at a time. It can address can this one. amendment pass and then you could have a second amendment to add in the funding piece. Okay. Or you could have this amendment fail and you could do two different ones or one. Either way. Okay. So for for the purposes of submitting this for other boards to see if we are going to put forward an amendment, um, I would be in favor of putting it forward as a single amendment um, and incorporating both um, pieces. So if we were going to change this piece about supplement and then we also want to say something about funding, I think we should submit it as one rewording um, as opposed to multiple small rewording. Right. We may have two, so then, I think, I, we may have two different thoughts that amend the, it sounds like we have two different things that we put people want to potentially address by, by amendment. Is I, I don't, so I don't understand what you're saying you brought. I think procedurally, it sounds like if we want to get them both in the same one, we should say no to this and try again with one that includes both the amendment to the language that you did, Alicia, but also includes the funding. Just so we're not doing two separate amendments and they're just in one. As long as oh, I'm actually going to contradict you, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so procedurally, I think it's fine for the board to vote on two separate amendments. But then I, my suggestion is that we submit our final product as a single amendment when it's presented to the other um, school boards as an amendment. Like I'm, I, I wouldn't recommend that we submit our amendment separately. That does not mean that we cannot change this right now into different amendments. I think that we would have to, uh, I don't think that we could do that, April. I think we'd have to pass the, uh, we'd have to come to a final version that we all agree to that passes tonight. And then that's what you present. Alicia's correct. Right. And we can actually do okay. a um, friendly amendment. So if we took what Alicia has on the motion now, if she's willing to accept a friendly amendment of the funding pieces, and then we can wrap it into one, in which case then you can vote on it together. And it's a single motion that you would send over to MSMA or whoever okay. is the delegate. Can I offer a friendly <laughs> amendment then? Yes. I have never heard the phrase friendly amendment before. I have <laughs> from town council. Oh, we've used it before. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I would um, propose to amend the resolution by removing 
the sentence, funding for online learning should be part of the school funding formula. Second. Like that. Alicia, are you okay with that as being part of the friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. All right, any further discussion? Um, so what, what is the full, are we adding a whole new sentence here in the middle about the, about the not, because I actually had an, I had a friendly amendment to try and kind of clean up the language a little bit, but if people are happy just adding another sentence, we can do that as well. I mean, I'm happier cleaning up the language, but it's all saying the same thing in the end. Right. I mean. May I propose a friendly amendment, and then if everyone hates it, I can I can be less. I I'll just go down. It'll be, and then it'll be it'll be unfriendly. It'll be unfriendly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that third back to that third sentence to what Alicia is what, to Alicia's amendment. Um, and I love the idea of the funding piece. Getting rid of that sentence that's the easiest way to take care of that. Um, so I propose we amend that sentence to incorporate the spirit of what Alicia is saying by doing the following. So distance learning should not be a fall, should not just be the fallback in a crisis, but used to supplement traditional instruction and provide equitable learning opportunities to all main students, regardless of their location. Yay, nay. I, I, I'm not sure that, that I, I, I'm not sure I, that that encompasses what I would like to say. I, I would like to address the issue that that I, I'm not sure that distance learning should should not be just be the fallback in a crisis. I think that it should be used um, for equitable opportunities and for um, times of cr crisis, but it should not be supplementing our traditional um, educational experience. Okay, then I, I withdraw the friendly amendment. And I mean, and, and Nick, I, I mean, you, you're <laughs> well, obviously welcome to disagree with me. Of and, course. And, and, you know, make your own motion, but, uh, but in terms of a friendly motion, I'm not sure that that encompasses my concern is that Augusta is going to try to push that in ways that I'm, I'm not anticipating. And so I, I think I'm more in the Christian camp about, about um, how we handle distance learning. Okay. Any other discussion? I guess, sorry, I don't, I don't have Alicia's wording, but I'm not against it being used as supplemental. I just don't want it to replace or like, like um, Diane said, supplant traditional learning. So I'm sorry, again, it, her, getting... her motion, it, it says it should not be used to replace traditional classroom instruction. That is oh, in the amendment. That's okay with me. That's what that's what Alicia said. Yes, yeah, so that doesn't preclude it from being supplemental. Then that's okay with me. Then okay, sorry. Correct. Thank you. But there's this, there is another sentence about being used in times of emergency, but I just didn't get that word for word. But I did get that other part word for word. So okay. thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, so we need to vote in two parts. We need to vote on the first amendment, which was as written, and that's where we're going to say no, and then we're going to accept with the changes that Alicia made, if that's the direction we're going, not that you have to vote that way. Um, so the first motion is to accept as written, and we can vote on that. Ms. Durgan. No. Mrs. Giftos? No. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalonis? No. 
Ms. Layton? No. Mrs. Scyther? No. Mrs. Turner? No. And Mr. Bennett? No. The motion fails. Yeah. And then the new motion is to accept with the amendments as presented by Alicia and Hillary. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? No. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. And the motion passes. Um, for the next one, um, building stronger family support for education. I'm going to hope that we can just read this real quickly rather than um, my reading it. Can I just ask a question? Of course. Um, is I didn't check to see if this was up on the website. My only concern with that is for the public if they wanted to know what the resolution was. Diane's doing a share screen. Does that right, count? so it is on this recording. People are able to see it. Awesome. I can certainly check with Kelly and um, see if it's on our website. No, if it's on your screen share, then I think that that's yep. fine. Thank you. Okay, sure. Has everyone had a chance to read it? Okay. Motion to accept as presented. So moved. Second. In discussion? Hillary? I mean, this one, I, it seemed, I, I don't, I guess, I thought we were already doing all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little confused as to why it needs to be a resolution. I mean, obviously if there's more we can do, I, I mean, I fully support it. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that, that's it. Sarah? Yeah, I actually don't really care for this one. One, uh, for the reason that Hillary stated, because it seems like what I just can't imagine like what legislation or sort of lobbying they could do with the state to help support this um like conceptually I think of course it makes sense but I also think that there could be some issues with equity um it speaks a lot about like having caregivers at home and there's an assumption that you know children have that available to them and accessible and so I think you know if we were to support this, we might want to offer some amendments to the language. I don't have those personally with me right now. Um, but I, to me, this, I don't know. That's, those are just my, my initial thoughts. April? I don't love this one either. Um, I think, though, thinking about how they would legislate you know how they would argue or or um press le for legislation for this i for me it, it's more like an initiative um if you think about like you know the the initiative to have the kids exercise and now i can't remember the the number chart that they show the five four wow. six one or whatever it is Kristen will know <laughs> five two one oh <laughs> five two one oh thank you Kristen so okay. so that to me is like you know they the that would be like if that you know MSBA decided that they wanted to encourage healthy eating a reduced screen time and more physical activity at home that they would promote that five two one zero program and so you know it would be essentially asking us like do you support us you know implementing this and hanging posters in the school. 
But for this, it, I agree with Sarah. Like, there's just something about the assumptions that it's making about about caregivers. And obviously, we want, as a district, to do everything we can to support all of our students, um, understanding that they have diverse um, home situations. And so I don't really know what advocacy for this one would look like. And since I'm not sure what that kind of advocacy advocacy would look like I I don't know if I support the spirit of this one Alicia I can never find the mute button um I don't like it either it seems like it, they were confused in what they were asking for um it at times it seems to be talking about early intervention um, when it, when they talk about preparing children for when they go to school. And um, I think that that's a state role, not a local educational role from uh, uh, at this point, at least. And we don't have the funding for that. It also would require um, our district to connect families with services and learning opportunities, including learning opportunities for parents. I just don't think that we have the resources to support that in, at the local district level. Um, and um, finally, they, you know, and, and, I, and that's not to say that I don't support the underlying premise. Um, I just am not sure that it's uh, something that should I would support at the district level, especially without funding. And um, finally, although I agree, and I've suffered from this myself, that working parents have schedules that make school visits or teacher contacts um, difficult. Um, that can be a contract issue and um, so I'm not sure that that's something I would support statewide as well. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, I, I'm just gonna echo really quickly and add my piece to what, to what Alicia said, I agree. I, if it, when I read it, it felt a bit out of our wheelhouse, to be honest, um, you know, especially the last sentence where it says, you know, you're connecting adults and children in a household to appropriate services, that screams DHHS to me and not not the responsibility of a local school department. I, I understand what it's saying. I agree with everything it's saying. I think absolutely the home environment is critical to successful learning, um, but I don't think it's the school department's places across the state to step into that. It feels like we're overlapping services a bit. Um, I had the same thoughts as I read it. It just felt awkward um, given all the things that we're already doing, all the places that we're already advocating for our students. Um, it just, I couldn't figure out what they were trying to do with this and what direction were they actually taking it in. So that gave me a lot of pause. It felt like it was opening up doors that we just didn't know where they were going to. Um, so not a huge fan of this one. Hillary? So I just wanna, um, I guess I wanna disagree a little bit I, so, you know, it feels, it doesn't feel good to vote no on a resolution that says we wanna help families um, connect more with their child's education. And I do understand your points about the vagueness and like kind of awkwardness of this. Um, and, I, and I totally agree with Sarah and April about how this is, um, exclusionary to some families or for some children who don't have the opportunities of having a, a permanent or um, caregiver, excuse me. Um, but I also just listened to an interview um, regarding anti-racism. And one of the things that stuck with me was, you know, if you are reading a legislation or a resolution or a statement and you think you know, it's going to do good for people, then it's a, then I guess, then it's, then it's good. Like, is it going to do good for, for, um, 
like socioeconomic, economically disadvantaged families? Yeah, it is. And maybe it is DHS, DHS, H S. Oh my God. DHHS's purview. But if we can all take on a piece of that pie and help people, it's like, I would rather have double coverage than no coverage, I guess. Um, and so I'm gonna just sit, just listening to the conversation. I don't think it's right for us to say this isn't in our wheelhouse um, because those students are our responsibility and making them as, you know, doing what we can to make their learning experience as healthy as possible, even if that includes reaching out beyond them to their community or their caregivers. I think that is our responsibility. And I'd rather have it be a lot of people's responsibility than to have it be only one person's. So yeah, it might be worded awkwardly. And I do agree that it, it does exclude, you know, it does make an assumption about caregiving. But in the end, I think the idea behind it is to do good for um, people who need it. So I'm gonna support it. Thank you. Pretty powerful words. Any other comments? Okay. I think we're ready to vote. Ms. Jurgen? Yes. Mrs. Giptos? No. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalonis? No. Ms. Layton? No. Mrs. Scyther? No. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Okay. Equity in education is the next one. Motion to accept as presented. So moved. Second. Second. And for discussion, Hillary, your hand is up. Oh, that was for last time, but I also have something to say about this one. Um, so this is something that um, I think should be done on an ongoing basis. Um, the, you know, it's, oh, I wish we didn't need a resolution to push these kinds of um, self-examinations to happen, um, but if it does help it to happen or there's any kind of legislation that, um, that can come of it that would help this kind of self-examination to happen, then I think it's valuable. Um, I personally would, you know, it talks about, um, recognizing like district leaders should facilitate self-examination and discussion around recognizing bias and stereotypes. I think it just should specifically address racism also, um, even though that is a type of bias, I guess. Um, but yeah, and, and I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, we have brought this up and, and it's starting in our district, but um, we have a long way to go and any other district that um, can be encouraged to do the same, I think is worthwhile. Thank you. Nick? So I, I just wanted to speak on this one a little bit. I'm not going to say a ton, but I did want to say that, um, you know, we're so fortunate in Scarborough to be located where we are in this state. And we are one of two states in the union, and we're all following the poll maps these days. We're one of two states that is divided as far as our districts go. And there's a reason for that. Maine is a very diverse and very divergent state when it comes to socioeconomic status and race and ethnicity, but certainly sexual orientation, all of these things that are, that, are, that are identified here. And we're lucky in this part of the state and the district we're in that there's been a lot of growth. Certainly I'm amazed at the growth that's happened in Scarborough since I graduated 22 years ago. Um, that's hard to say, but there are other areas in the state um, that I am familiar with that have not seen that level of growth. And so when I read this, I think about all those districts that haven't evolved the way that Scarborough has, and, and, and Hillary's right, Scarborough still has a long, we still have ways to go, just as everyone does. 
Um, but I'm really thinking about supporting this because of all the different communities that really need this type of state mobilization to do that type of self-examination because they're not doing it to the degree that we are everywhere. So that, that's how I, I see it and I'm, I'm in full support of this. Alicia? I actually think that um, this resolution is grossly underwhelming. Um, I think it pays lip service to the issue. Um, I don't think that it really proposes any meaningful change. I think that it um, I think that it's um, it's not something I would support as written because I think that it's um, uh, actually embarrassing what 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 how they're proposing to handle it. I mean, I think that it should be um, offering solutions and suggestions and not just saying, "Oh, you can't discriminate and be biased." I mean, that's the law, like okay, that's a great aspiration to have. So um, I, I feel like there should have been more thought and um, movement put into, into that resolution. Thank you. Max? Um, so as has been said so many times tonight, I really appreciate the spirit of the resolution. I think that, you know, whoever wrote this, their heart is in the right place. But I, I actually, I agree with Mrs. Giftos on just how it's presented. I feel like um, they kind of skirt the issue in terms of just saying that we need to have like self-examination and discussion it's kind of just implying that you need to go through the motions of anti-bigotry to literally be an anti-bigot, which is not at all true. I think that, you know, they say bias, but I really think like the issue should be talked about head on where they just name drop like racism, prejudice, something like that. And I also think that there should be something added. I don't know how this would look about like, um, intervention being necessary in schools in terms of like um, punishment for students and staff who committed infractions or something like that. I agree with Alicia that there's no like follow through to what's being said in this law, although I appreciate it nonetheless. Thank you. April? Um, first, I'll say that you guys are so impressive and the comments that you guys make make me think so much so thank you for people who spoke before me um nick i i i really appreciate what you had to say and then alicia like man <laughs> it what you have to say about this not going far enough um also really makes me think um that being said I think we do have to recognize that there is work to be done by everyone. Um, and that while we may not feel like this resolution goes far enough to lay out those plans um, or lay out a concrete you know, way for districts to implement these kinds of things. Um, to Nick's point, you know, some of these conversations are long overdue in districts um, that aren't as um, willing to have these conversations as we are. And so for us to uh, assume that we can maybe skip ahead or force something um, more progressive, and I'm not going to use all the right words, um, so I hope I'm not saying something that is intentionally, uh, unintentionally um, insensitive, but you know, as we have these conversations, I do think that we need to appreciate that um, not everybody is where we are at here in Scarborough. Um, and so that while we may feel like there's a lot more work to be done um, and that the resolution doesn't go far enough, I, I think that for some districts, it does need to be a starting place. Um, and so I would support this. Thank you. Hillary? So I just wanted to um, play devil's advocate a little bit with 
like Alicia and and Max because you know very few of these resolutions have a specific outcome or agenda. They're mostly, of course, the next one is going to have a specific outcome. But for the ma the majority of these, for the three years that I've been doing this, have been kind of like um, guiding statements, and then they you know, use that, that guiding statements to inform advocacy at the state level. Um, and while I completely agree with you that this isn't even close to covering, you know, this entire issue, I don't think it's not, it's, you know, again, I go back to this, it, it's not, it's not harming people of color and it can only do, you know, be beneficial, especially to districts who aren't um, having these conversations. And you know, Scarborough like sort of is starting to have this conversation, but you know, I don't think, and maybe this is not the time or place, I don't think Scarborough is in a place that is, um, I guess, I guess I don't think we're so much different. Like we might be willing to start having this conversation, but it's 2020. Like, you know, we, we haven't had this conversation for all these years. Um, so, you know, Scarborough has a ton of work to do. Um, and, but, you know, and, and maybe this is something that we may have started on. And if it gets somebody else started on that same path, then I don't think there's any, I think that's a good thing. I just want to, a couple of thoughts, but I wanted to first echo what April said, which is just the power of sort of voice and conversation, because I think I had one thought, and then after hearing what Max and Alicia said, it's kind of, it was just struck me as um, just really intellectual and um, has made me sort of rethink this. But, but I also think that you know, a couple steps forward is better than no steps forward. And, and what Hillary said, you know, on the last vote and just reiterated there has stuck with me. So I would, I would, and this isn't a formal amendment, but I guess maybe just a question to Max and Alicia, you know, if, if we changed, if we offered an amendment that changed some of the language from uh, like believes all district leaders should facilitate to like requires that, all district leaders to facilitate um, and then to change bias to like discrimination or, you know, be like a little bit more explicit with our language. Is that something that you guys think would sit better, would sit better with you or, or no? I'm trying to draft something quickly. I should have done it before, but I didn't, unfortunately. I apologize for that. So, um, and and could you repeat your your suggestion, Sarah? S discrimination instead of bias, and what was the other one? The first one was just so it says, uh, Maine School Board Association believes all district leaders should facilitate. I think we could change that to something stronger to like requires or. I don't even know if we can do that, but I I think it should. Uh, maybe we could say that self-examination and discussion around discrimination and stereotyping. Yeah, I, I agree, Sarah. Should, I, I should be required as part of the curriculum or something like that. Okay. That's, That's kind of what I had said in the beginning, like that last sentence there. The main school board association believes all district leaders should facilitate a self-examination and discussion around recognizing bias and stereotyping. Like that's, like that's weak. It needs to say, well, in my opinion, it should say, you know, racism, prejudice, prejudice, um, discrimination. Like it, it should just say what it is. I feel like bias and stereotyping. Well, and like, it shouldn't say, it shouldn't use like a um, motive type words or right it's like beliefs right yeah yeah anyways Alicia let us know when you have something <laughs> Krista okay. those are all helpful things <laughs> I I think that what April and Hillary both said made a lot of 
sense to me that this is a starting point. And I think part of what I hated about the first resolution is it was trying to do so much that you almost lost the very basic point of what they were trying to accomplish. And while this one maybe for some people doesn't go far enough, but I think it does accomplish just the very basic point of these conversations need to happen and they need to start somewhere. And I worry a little bit if we alter it too much, then that doesn't work for as Nick said, our state is really, really different. And I think if we overcomplicate it, no, I'm not saying, and I'm not saying what Sarah said is overcomplicating it, but if we do get too complicated in it, are we, is it not broad enough to have everyone feel it works for them to start in their district? So I almost am glad it's very vague because it is going to look so different in each district. Thank you. When you say it works for them, what do you mean by that? Just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to clarify it's okay. what you said. If this is, if the way it's worded now is something that is enough, if there is a district that's not in the same place or doesn't is more, a little more resistant to having these conversations. This is, I, I, I don't know how you argue with this point. I think it's a, a, I don't know how to say it correctly. No, I, I understand what you're saying. And like, I, I totally appreciate everyone's points in terms of like, um, like this is, this is good enough. Like this is pushing people in the right direction. But like, from my point of view, we can't just sit here and say like, oh, this is good enough. Like we can't just sit here and say, we can't do better if this is not inciting any actual action on these issues, because obviously we can do better. And like it, these, this is literal students' lives existing as the people that they are in the districts and like the schools that they go to. And if we're gonna sit here and say that we can't advocate for them more then that is basically giving up on those students. And I don't wanna say that you're doing that because I know that you're not. And like, I know that you don't, you're not implying that, but that is just how I would perceive it as someone who identifies with these issues. I very much appreciate that. And I guess I would say to that, my point is that these conversations should happen and it's, making everyone feel welcome to have them and not like, I don't know, I guess to me, when you say you require them to do it, it instantly will might put someone on their heels. And that's not what you want. When you really want people to come to the table and have these conversations, it needs to be, Again, I'm struggling with the right word for it, but it is not my intention to say we can't do better. I know we can do better, absolutely. But again, we are not the entire state. And I this agree. group of people isn't even our entire town. Not everyone is going to feel about them the same. So I think the broader we can keep it, the easier it is to start those conversations. And then you push and you push. If that makes sense no yeah i agree we definitely have to like be conscious of the contingency this is going to in terms of like maybe not everyone is comfortable or able to have these conversations and i agree that you know we can't, like it, it it to for it to be received well it cannot be like radical like i don't know what that even means but like i i i agree with what you're saying yeah and maybe requires just too strong of a, of a word, Kristen, because I, I agree, but... No, I'm not saying it is too strong. You, I'm you, just, sorry, Sarah. I'm, I'm just thinking like, like process-wise, right? The way this is going to go, whatever, if we put something in there that's stronger, that, that it you know requires this type of discussion, there's going to be a, how many other districts that come and some of them are going to say, yep, this is good the way it is. Hopefully no one says, nope, we shouldn't even pass this. But then it just it just encourages discussion and debate. And so I think it's good to have, you know, to put what, whatever we feel it should be, we should stand by that. And if ultimately where it lands is somewhere in the middle, then 
I think we maybe we can live with that, but we should at least put in there what what we think is right for our district. I, I think that's true, Sarah, because ultimately, you know, if we put what we think and that amendment fails, we still have this resolution that, you know, hopefully wouldn't fail. And I think, you know, to to Max's point too, like we I I, I completely understand what you're saying because we can always do better. We can especially do better for, um, you know, for all these kids in our, all, <coughs> sorry, all the kids in our schools, but, you know, it doesn't all have to be in one MSBA resolution. You know, we can start here and then say, you know what? Wow, that resolution passed. I'm really glad to see that. Let's push that and do something else next month. And, um, and, you know, like, or like, let's do something here in Scarborough and use that as a model for somebody else, you know, so I just think that as well meaning as, as that is to try and like, I do think we should always be pushing harder and always trying to do more and, and examining ourselves to make sure that, um, or just to, to be honest with ourselves about what we're doing in Scarborough and how we can address issues that arise, but um, you know, that can't all be done in, in one legislation or one resolution or whatever that might be. It has to be done, um, in steps and hopefully they're not like really slow and incremental, which it has been for, for so long now, hopefully, um, you know, there's like, there can be a little bit more fire and, and we can get there more quickly now that there's, um, such a, you know, this is, this issue is, um, raised all over the country right now, you know, and it's, it's, um, it just, I guess my point is that it can't can all happen at, in one, you know, one paragraph, it's going to take, you know, and from the school board level, it's going to be different policies and, you know, and then from the student level, it'll be different clubs, different activities, different educate, you know, education, anti-racist education, anti discrimination education from the teachers it'll be I'm just saying that it takes on so many different pathways that um that it, it's hard to combine it all into this one little paragraph <laughs> that was long sorry Alicia thank you I I wanted to speak on a distinct issue but um, I'm sorry, something Kristen said made me want, really want to respond. So I know I've already spoken once, but I hope you don't mind that I respond to this briefly. Um, I, I, I think that um, I can respect your perspective about saying, you know, we want everybody to collaborate and come to the table. But um, my perspective is that um, it should be worded strongly. Um, there are people that are um, hold this perspective willfully and may not want to come to the table. There are people who are negligent in not trying to improve their perspective. Um, and then there are people who just sort of might be those types of people who could come to the table and and educate themselves. But I do think that there is a broad spectrum spectrum of individuals um, who are okay with the status quo. And that, that from my perspective is, um, inadequate and not, not sufficient. And I don't think that, um, this is a subject matter where I want, would like to take a passive voice. I think that, you know, if anything, it's something that we should be really speaking out strongly against. Um, whether people like it or not. I mean, I think that um, the fact that we have to pass a resolution for people to follow the law and to, um, to not discriminate against others in our school systems requires a loud voice. And so I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I am working on the language about the, for the amendment. One of the things that I wanted to um, just sort of uh, discusses the second par the second full paragraph where it says bias exists sometimes in overt actions in our schools. 
that to me is a little confusing and I wish that they would put some of these resolutions in perspective and include sort of their conversations of how they propose these resolutions because I mean, obviously it occurs overtly. I mean, for me, I think it's more of the indistinct ways that it it happens in our schools that are it is even harder to address. And so I don't understand what they're trying to say there. And then they say there should be high aspirations for all students. That to me is a really bizarre sentence. I think what they're saying is that for people who are discriminated against, either they don't have high aspirations for themselves or the school system doesn't have high aspirations for them and doesn't support them. And so I, I'm not really sure what the point is of that. If the point is that we shouldn't say that if you're in a low socioeconomic class, then you can't go to college. I mean, like, let's say what you're saying. We should support all students regardless of race or, or socioeconomic status in their pursuit of additional academic event, event, um, adventures or or academic excellence or expectations or so so to me that's really vague and and but and and almost and, um, I don't want to say offensive but condescending I guess is the way it presents to me can I just have a point of clarification Alicia I agree with everything you're saying but I don't think we can amend the rationale or can okay. we Okay, I don't is know. This, if that's a good is, point. That just, is it just the amendment, like the top part? It is. And it's then the amendment. rationale is just like, here's why we're doing this. Okay. Well, their rationale like, is hard to follow. I, I know, <laughs> it sucks. I, I totally agree with you. Their rationale is ridiculous, but like, okay. or it's worded. I shouldn't say that. It's not worded. I agree with you. I agree with you, but I just, I, I don't know if we can amend that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Nick? So I've been I've been looking at this wording as well, and and looking at the top. There's only two sentences in the top. The first one is is kind of a statement of principle, which I'm okay with. I'm listening to everybody, and particularly Max, you fired me up a little bit and brought me back to some earlier activist times in my life. And so thank you for that because I needed that reminder. Um, the second sentence I think is where we could add a little beef to this, and so I've taken a swing at this. And I, I'm going to read what I wrote here in Notepad, which Notepad uses the most terrible font. Um, but I'm going to read this and see what folks think of it. See if we're getting somewhere where we're being a little more assertive with also recognizing the different places districts around the state are. So instead of the sentence that's there, I wrote, the Maine School Boards Association believes all districts should facilitate ongoing self-examination and discussions to identify every form of discrimination and prejudice with the goal of effectively eliminating them. Does that add a little more teeth, a few more teeth? I'd like to read mine too, just because maybe we could come up with a combination. I, I actually took out what the MSMA part I just said all district leaders should facilitate an examination and discussion of these issues in their district that recognizes racism, prejudice, discrimination, discriminatory practices, and stereotyping and should adopt policies and practices to eliminate them. These practices should include curriculum development, expanded instruction, professional development, and social emotional opportunities that aim to reduce racism and discrimination in our schools. I like that. Yeah, I do too. Well, I'll move to amend the resolution as Wait, just hold on, have. Alicia. Can you, before you amend it though, can you, like the very first part of your sentence believes all this should facilitate self examination and discussion around what these issues? Is that this what you said? All district leaders should it takes out the MSMA part. Yep, yeah. All district leaders should facilitate an examination and discussion of these issues in oh, their okay. district. Meaning the issue, okay, got it, sorry. I The issues identified in the sentence before, in, right? in the first sentence, okay, thank you. In their yeah, district yeah. that recognizes racism, prejudice, discrimination, discriminatory practices, and stereotyping and should adopt policies and practices to eliminate them. These practices should include curriculum development, expanded instruction, 
professional development and social emotional opportunities that aim to reduce racism and discrimination in our schools. Should include, but are not limited to. So I'd move to amend the resolution um, to replace that um, second sentence as just read. Second. Kristen? Yeah, Alicia, can you read the second part of that wording again? And I'll tell you my slight hesitation with the second sentence of that. And I do want to hear it again because I, I I don't know. I don't have it in front of me. I do much better when I have something in front of me I can read. But I have I would throw out there as a concern that without having done a self-examination of our district, we are assuming the way your sentence is worded, like where Hillary said, should include, but not limited to, I almost would go the opposite way and say that those things should be included where it's determined it's necessary. But we don't, we haven't even done this work in our district to know where our problems are. We don't know that we have a problem in every one of those areas. And you may be, do and maybe I'm just not there yet, but I would like to see it. So do you mind just reading that last sentence? Cause I might be yeah. hearing it. I, yeah, I will say that the way it's worded says that it's a, these practices are to aim to reduce discrimination and bias in, in our schools. And so I, I would imagine that if a school does a reflective practice and determines they don't have any problems in their district, then they wouldn't have to um, engage in those activities. But um, it says these practices should include, but are not limited to curriculum development, expanded instruction, professional development, and social emotional opportunities that aim to reduce racism and discrimination in our schools. And I guess for me, I would almost change that to could include or may include in because we don't necessarily know where we need the work. I'm not saying that we have anything perfect, but I think it's a pretty bold statement to assume that we have every single area needs to be fixed. I don't think that that's what that sentence says. I think it's saying look at all of the different areas and where it's not right make changes which is a process that we're actually undergoing currently as a district max i feel like you keep wanting to say something but you're on mute. you're you were on mute when you were going off before You're still, still mute, buddy. We can't hear you, Max. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Great. Cool. So you said at one point, um, I can't remember what it was. I think you said stereotyping. And I think that that should be replaced with something that's more on the nose, like all forms of bigotry or something, because I, I just don't think it, if we're using this frilly language, this like fluffy little like, oh, bias, oh, stereotyping. I think that's just like, if we are not able to call out the issue by name, then we are being, then we are giving it like silent approval or almost just being like complicit with it. So I think that it should be more specific on what we are saying or what we're condemning or like saying that they should look at. Can you give examples again, Max, of what you're saying the conduct is that's not explicit? Um, so when you say the words like bias or stereotyping, I think that like stereotyping 
while it is descriptive, I think that's already covered when you say prejudice, because prejudice is basically stereotyping. So I don't think you need to say that. And then when you say bias, I think you just need to say something along the lines of like all forms of bigotry, or you could even say that for stereotyping. I think it just needs to be, those words aren't specific enough. So this says racism, prejudice, discrimination, discriminatory practices, and stereotyping. I don't think it needs to say stereotyping because it's, it, it's just kind of redundant in my opinion. I must Google stereotyping. I'm interested now. It says from my search that it's an overgeneralized belief about a, cat a particular category of people, which I would say is basically the same thing as prejudice, except stereotyping is um, not necessarily negative, but prejudice is. Yeah, that's the difference. Prejudice is an, an, an action that you take, I think, based on the stereotype, maybe, or based yes. on a belief. Prejudice is like an unconscious um, or like subconscious opinion of something that you act on without realizing it. Well, it can be, but it can also be, you can also do it by, real, you can also realize it. Oh, absolutely. It can feel yeah. like your overt whatever. I think this is a really important conversation. Um, and I agree with the changes that are being made. I do wanna be super cautious though in the fact that this is going to change. Um, we can hone this down to exactly what we want. And I don't think, there stands a really good chance that it's gonna be turned over 150 times before a vote is made. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. I'm not negating the conversation. I agree with everything that has been said. Um, I think that we're making really good strides in the district. We have more strides to make, um, many more strides to make. I just wanted to caution us as we're working through wording that I don't know how long the wording will stick. If I may ask, when you say strides in the district, what do you mean by that? Um, I think that the fact that we're having the conversations that we've opened up the con we've opened that up to communication. We've addressed the issue with the gym, the situations with curriculum being adjusted. Um, it's not perfect by any stretch, but we're starting to make those inroads. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that this is exactly, this discussion that we're having is, is it exactly what the spirit of the revolution or resolution is implying. So, um, are we comfortable with the wording that Alicia's amendment was apt to move forward? I don't think she made the amendment, but I'm comfortable with the wording. Alicia, do you want to make the formal amendment? I, I did. I, I moved I it. thought you had. Somebody seconded it. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. I seconded it. Oh, I was going to say, I hope it wasn't me who seconded it. <laughs> All right. Um, so similar to the first one, we would need to vote on the first resolution as presented, depending on how we vote. And then we'll come back with the resolution as amended by Alicia. Can you just reread the amendment before we vote? Alicia, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah, no problem. I just had to move windows. Um, 
All district leaders should facilitate an examination and discussion of these issues in their district that recognizes racism, prejudice, discrimination, discriminatory practices, and stereotyping, and should adopt policies and practices to eliminate them. These practices should include, but are not limited to, curriculum development, expanded instruction, professional development, and social emotional opportunities that aim to reduce racism and discrimination in our schools. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we're ready to vote on the first motion. Great. Ms. Durgan? No. Mrs. Giftos? No. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalonis? No. Mrs. Scyther? No. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? No. You forgot me, Diane. Oh, I am so sorry. Miss Layton? No. <laughs> I apologize. That's all right. All right. Um, so then move to vote for the resolution with amendment. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right, the last one, um, board meeting remote participation. Can we all agree that all of these have been worded like fairly awful? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So moved. <laughs> Hillary. So, um, I mean, yeah, so these, the wording on these aren't great. Um, I don't know if it's worth it to wordsmith this one. I mean, I think I've heard almost every single one of us say that the fact that we have, we, we can allow remote participation, not just from us, but from the community in this, during this time has only increased our community involvement. And it's allowed people who maybe wouldn't normally be able to get to a meeting to, to be involved. And so, I, I mean, I, um, I think that if we can continue that in some manner, um, that it's beneficial for the community. Leanne, you procedurally, can you get a motion before we have discussion? Oh, I thought I had done that, sorry. Um, motion to approve, um, the motion to approve as presented. So moved. Second. Thank you, April. Okay, no problem. I just said counts now, right? Of course it does. <laughs> Nick? Yeah, the wording is terrible, but I agree. I, I think that wordsmithing <laughs> it here because it's gonna get, it's gonna get taken apart is not really worth necessarily our time. But the two things that I love, that I like about it, one Hillary just talked on, which is that it's allowed people to participate in our meetings without having to come to town hall. That's really important, I think. Um, I also think about our ability to recruit a diverse palette of board members moving forward, not just in Scarborough, but across the state. And, you know, a lot of people travel a lot for work. They have a lot of commitments. And, and, and I think it's so important to have a broad palette of people on school boards. And if this allows more people to serve in roles like the ones we're sitting in now, um, then I think it's great. And using technology to expand that is, is a good use of those tools. Just to piggyback on what both um, Hillary and Nick have said, I am wholeheartedly in favor of retaining this. This has been huge as far as getting um, engagement and participation. Um, thinking of you know snow days in the future, we can continue to meet. I mean, it, it gives us a lot of opportunity to stay nimble. 
Um, also recognizing that so many people have cut cords and wouldn't have been able to see us otherwise. Um, this, offer, this opens us up um, again to much more community feedback and engagement. So I'm all in favor. The wording is horrible, but that's okay. Um, that said, I think we're ready to vote. Very good. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Sither? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. All right, 6.3, Kate Bolton. It's all about FY20 year-end financial reporting. I guess. <clears throat> I always seem to get to do this report about the time everyone's ready for bed. <laughs> and tonight is no, no different. Um, so I'll try to be fairly quick. The other, other problem is that I don't think the Zoom environment, as much as we've just advocated strongly for it, it, it lends itself very poorly to reading tiny little print of tiny little spreadsheets. Um, so I, I did want to start out by saying that we've, uh, Kelly's posted the supporting documents on the website. So if people are in fact trying to follow along at home, uh, they can go to the meeting page um, for this meeting on the school board's page of the website, and they can click on the supporting documents, which is the financial statement that I'm using to refer to this. And I think you all have received that um, from Kelly as a backup email. Um, so what I'll do is uh, start with the financial statement and, and kind of work our way through high level. Um, Kelly, if you want to go to the next slide. Is Kelly driving or is it Diane? It's Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so there's there's two backup items that you've been provided with this evening. One is the financial statement and the other is the year end budget transfers to be approved. Um, and as I pointed out, you can find those on the website. Once we get done with the meeting, the actual financial reports get posted up on the website as well on the Finance Committee's page, so folks can read those at their leisure. Um, the published financial statement will start with two pages of notes and comments, which is my sort of narrative way of letting people, um, leading people through the financial statements if they don't happen to be present for my scintillating descriptions. Um, I think it's uh, some of the items that we point out are the, um, the pieces that you want to note in those financial statements are not always obvious if you're not used to looking at them. So we try to make it a little clearer for folks uh, on the outside to look at it. You'll notice that uh, looking at the financial statement that it says pending audit uh, on the top of all the pages. This is the time of year when the auditors come in and join us and go through the financials for uh, the prior fiscal year. And so they actually issue the, the official financial statement for FY20. Um, that's something they produce for the town and the schools. Um, so there may be some adjustments to what we're presenting tonight. Uh, I don't anticipate big adjustments uh, because typically it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we've worked with them long enough that we know what they're looking for. Uh, but we do put that little disclaimer on there. So, um, this is uh, just to set the tone. This is the first time in about 20 years of my doing this work that I'm presenting a, a fourth quarter statement in a pandemic environment. And uh, I've got to say that, that finance has, has uh, experienced a lot of the same challenges that we've experienced across the district in our, in our lives. Um, and things have been really weird. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit this evening. Kelly, if you want to go to the next one. Uh, Kelly told me she's kind of fast on the trigger here. She's got a, she's got a new mouse and it's going quick. Uh, so the first uh, big number that we're going to see here, we'll start on page 
three, if you're following along at the top with the general fund expenditures section, this is the uh, actual financial statement after the two pages of descriptive text. Um, that's a record of our budget to actual expenditures. And you can see there's a very big number um, at the top of this page. The closure of our schools on March 16th created the conditions for a very atypical last quarter of fiscal year. On the expenditure side, we ended with a large surplus in the general fund. We came in under budget by $1.8 million, um, which um, by the way, represents about 3.6% of our total FY20 operating budget. Um, you'll see my note here, the personnel costs represent 79% of the FY20 budget. Um, we, that's about what we average over year over year. And we did have an ordinary turnover savings of approximately $200,000, which again is fairly typical, um, happening in the fall of the fiscal year, fall of 2019. And then per the governor's executive order, which came through on March 19th after schools were shut down, um, she required that all school personnel continue to receive their full pay and benefits through the end of the 2019-2020 school year. So as a result, we didn't really see a significant reduction in spending for many of our regular salary, wage and benefit accounts during the last quarter of FY20. Um, but we did see some changes, um, some big effects in other areas. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we'll take a look at that. So in the personnel realm, even though we were still paying our folks their regular wage and benefits, those were you know, full-time employees, regular wages, um, we did see some significant budget savings in some areas. Um, we had a big savings in the area of substitutes because when we were all at home, we didn't use in-person substitutes at the end of the school year. Um, I should say that, that all of these accounts typically have a little bit of savings year over year um, because we always do strive to and have to by law come in under budget, uh, but these are just a little bit bigger than what we're used to seeing. Uh, second bullet, $150,000 in special services staff turnover and prolonged open positions. Um, we had some changes in positions that never actually stayed filled. Um, $100,000 in IT staff turnover. And uh, our IT staff that work in the schools are actually town employees. And the, the town employees, unfortunately, were not protected by the governor's order. And therefore, uh, there were some furloughs put in place. Um, and there was, in, in fact, an employee who was laid off before the end of the school year in that department. Um, so we did have some budgetary savings there that you know, was an unfortunate choice, but a strategic decision by the town in order to save some money. And then finally on this page, transportation. We've had staff vacancies um, for years now, uh, but we also had uh, limited extra trips, limited overtime uh, in that spring quarter, uh, also leading to us saving a little bit of money on stock. Next, Cal. Um, going on to some of the other areas where we saved some money over budget um, in programs and services, uh, we did delay and defer some curriculum professional development. We had $160,000 in savings uh, in athletic stipends, officials, game management, contracted transportation. Uh, contracted transportation, we were doing a little bit better through the entire school year. But of course, a lot of these impacts are coming um, in the springtime when we pretty much lost our spring season for sports. Um, and in special education, uh, we had a certain amount of disruption in um, services for some of our out of district students. Um, and uh, although it was cobbled together in much the same way that our remote learning was cobbled together for our um, general education students, we did have some uh, back and forth in terms of out of district programs. Um, we did continue to pay for most of that, but there were some savings incurred. And then finally, uh, we've got some comments here about 
facilities and operations. And one of the first things someone said to me was, well, you're going to shut the doors, you're going to turn the heat down, you're going to turn the lights off. And boy, are you guys going to save a lot of money. Well, we did save some money uh, in that area. Um, we saved on custodial supplies and contracted services because we weren't really using the buildings. Um, and we saved on utilities. And we also saved on gasoline and vehicle maintenance because we weren't running all of our buses um, and even our facilities vehicles weren't running around quite as much doing the day-to-day -day work that, they're, um, that they would do under normal circumstances. Kelly, you're really good at this. Uh, so uh, the school board is required by policy DVJ to vote approval of budget transfers for any individual account overspent by $10,000 or more. Um, and a handout was provided as a supporting document to the board. I think, I don't know that that, whether that one is posted or not. I might be able to pull that up later on. Um, but uh, that's something that we work from every year. And uh, this year there are 12 accounts in FY20 that will need year-end transfers. Um, and I, I do like to point out that there are uh, over 650 general ledger accounts uh, in our general fund. And for 12 of them to be a problem that needs our resolution, I think is, you know, it's pretty good. It's a, it's a testament to the hard work that we do to budget as accurately as we can. Um, the packet that you received on the, um, on the budget transfers, it includes the account that is um, overspent by more than $10,000. It includes the accounts that have surplus available that we can transfer to cover that deficit. And a little quick note to explain why we might have uh, a deficit or surplus in those areas. Um, you may recall that we try to keep budget transfers within the voter categories our budget is set up in um, because the statute says, a statute says that you can't transfer more than 5% out of one budget category into another in any given year. And the, the purpose behind that is to honor the wishes of your local voters. When they pass your budget, they pass it based on the categories um, that you uh, budgeted for and you're not really supposed to wiggle that around too much. So this year, all the budget transfers we need to do are within the same voter categories as the deficits. So here we see the revenue page. And uh, remember we have a $1.8 million expenditure surplus. Um, we have spent less money than we budgeted, uh, but we also have a shortfall in the revenues that we budgeted. A small shortfall, $236,000. Um, some of this shortfall comes from uh, familiar areas that we've seen in prior years. GPA is diverted to pay special purpose private schools by the Department of Education. Um, that's something that we've talked about a number of times and uh, it's a little bit silly. Can I say that? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a a terrible system actually, but it, it's the system we have and, and we do account for that. We've accounted for that in our budget projections for next year that we're not expecting to get our full GPA. State agency client reimbursement goes up and down every year. It depends on uh, the children in the district who qualify for those services and that reimbursement. So that's a, a bit of a moving target. And then finally, we did have an impact of school closure on uh, rentals and fees. We closed our buildings and the busy spring season during which we often host a lot of events. Um, and uh, we have our sports and athletics fees, uh, athletics and activity fees for the spring. Those were refunded to families and um, the buildings themselves were shut and we weren't able to host some of those events where we raise rental revenue. So this page, uh, this appears on page four uh, of the financial statement. This is a chart showing you the big picture transition from the beginning to the end of the fiscal year in general fund. At the top of the chart, you start with the first, the beginning of the fiscal year, 
what fund balance was available at the end of FY19, um, the amount that we used towards non-tax revenue in FY20, and then the undesignated fund balance on July 1st, 2019. Um, and then the middle part of this chart shows you what happened during FY20. And it's the, uh, the balance available from the expenditures, um, appropriations, in other words, for expenditures, the revenue shortfall, um, year-end adjustments, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the year-end balance. So we, we actually generated a net amount of $1.17 million in uh, the course of FY20. So you add the beginning fund balance to the fund balance generated during the course of the year, and you get the 1.36 million at the bottom of the chart. And you may recall that we used 700,000 of that in our FY21 budget, the year that we're currently in, as non-tax revenue. So that leaves us with undesignated fund balance, meaning it's not allocated to anything, it's not promised to anything of $668,000. So this is actually kind of a cool thing because when we started the year, you see that $193,000 of undesignated fund balance at the beginning of FY20, that was a little bit of a cause for concern for me because I generally like to see, you know, $500,000 in the bank, maybe, you know, sometimes it's 300, sometimes it's 600 but um, less than $200,000 of undesignated fund balance makes me a little anxious. So um, good news is we generated a huge amount of fund balance in this last fiscal year. Um, and, and if there is any bad news, it's that uh, we've also used a great deal of fund balance in our budget for FY21. So that when we go to build our FY22 budget, we're going to have $700,000 in revenue that we need to sustain in order to not add to the tax burden for our local taxpayers. Um, so FY20, uh, I, I should mention right now that, that we have gone off in kind of an interesting direction in, in FY21 now with the, the coronavirus relief fund, the CRF money that we've been talking about. We've got two different awards, over $4 million coming into Scarborough. And um, I mean, that's been absolutely awesome and critical in allowing us to open schools safely. Um, we've invested in extra personnel, we've invested in materials, and equipment, um, and I'm, I'm sure that at some point when we get a moment to breathe, we'll have a sort of a recap and a, and a report out on exactly where that money has gone. I've given you a couple of quick updates on that. Um, but the, the Coronavirus Relief Fund ends on December 30. And there can be no money spent from those funds for any services or products or materials uh, that are in use on January 1. So we're a little bit concerned about what that means for us for the rest of the year, because I don't think any of us really thinks that life is going to change and it's all going to be unicorns and rainbows on January 1st. I think we're going to be uh, managing the same school environment that we were managing in December, um, even if we're real optimistic about what the spring looks like. Uh, so Having this fund balance as a cushion, I think, makes me feel pretty good. Um, I hope that we'll be able to generate additional surplus in FY21, but there's a lot of unknowns in that area. So in the financial statement, um, I know you're all reading along with this at home. This is like the most exciting stuff, right? So. Uh, adult debt is on the bottom half of page four under that chart that we were just looking at. Um, we spent a lot of our time talking about the general fund. We spend most of our time in, in budget time um, and uh, in management and operations talking about general fund because that's the bulk of the money that we have at our disposal. But we also have adult ed, school nutrition, federal restricted funds, grants and trusts, and capital improvement projects. So 
As with our K-12 programs, adult ed also experienced the effects of school closure and the stay-at-home order that was in place here in Maine in the first, uh, the last quarter of FY20. Some of our instruction was able to move online. Uh, we have these really popular workforce programs and English language learner programs that were in full swing. And we really felt that um, it would have been um, immoral and um, very damaging to just let those students drop um, because they were on a pathway to achieving some success, many of them in a new country and certainly in a new state uh, and um, all of them in new careers. So a lot of that was, was able to be continued uh, with some in-person instruction and mostly online instruction. But a lot of our enrichment courses were, were canceled, um, the, the more um, sort of elective courses uh, were not available and uh, we didn't have the flexibility to put those online because, um, well, we didn't really have the infrastructure for it. Um, so the tuitions that we budgeted for adult ed fell short by about $40,000, a little less than $40,000. Um, we did have a surplus on the expenditure side. We had the addition of some unexpected grant revenues. Um, so we ended with a deficit of $1,100. And um, using carryover from the prior year, uh, prior year fund balance, we actually ended in the black, a positive undesignated fund balance of $2,800. So uh, still, still in the black in adult education. School nutrition is at the bottom of page, uh, sorry, at the top of page five of the financial report. Uh, the school nutrition program had to rise to the challenge of providing healthy meals for our students and their families in truly extraordinary circumstances to close out FY20. Um, uh, as with the other departments, we did continue to pay wages and benefits during the school closure um, under the executive order and the staff um, turned their attention to trying to figure out how to create packaged, prepackaged meals, um, single service meals, full family meals that could be picked up by families and or delivered um, by the transportation department who stepped up big time to take food into our community. At first we used the existing backpack program structure um, and we had a bunch of community members stepping up to donate food and time and money um, and a huge outpouring of support from local food banks and partnering up with Project Grace. And really the, the worry about food insecurity was huge at first and the response was extraordinary. And then the USDA stepped in and said they were going to create waivers for local school districts so that they could run what was essentially the summer lunch program. And the summer USDA lunch program has far fewer restrictions in terms of how you feed your community. Um, and this is actually the system that we're still working with right now, even though summer has come and gone, they've kept us under that same program and they've just announced that they're going to continue it through the rest of the school year. To June 2021, which is truly awesome. It means that we can feed any child in Scarborough, uh, regardless of whether they are in school or school age, um, free breakfast and free lunch every day. Um, we're currently preparing seven days worth of meals for families to take home. Um, the school lunch program there's another topic for a cool workshop. Um, we'll have Peter have to come back and tell us about how they're doing this because they've, they've pivoted to this remarkable takeout sort of system where they're packaging everything individually for kids. Um, they're delivering orders, they're taking orders online. It's all, there's no money changing hands. So, you know, all touchless ordering. Um, and uh, I, I think that they've created this amazing system and it, it's working really well. And the, the good news is that we don't have to use our backpack money to support it because the USDA reimbursement in the summer program is actually 
uh, quite sufficient to cover our costs, um, which is certainly not the case during the school year. Um, so if we're looking, let's go back to the financial statement, right? Uh, if we're looking at the financial statement, we'll see that school nutrition came in under budget on the expenditure side, but well under budget on the revenue side as well. The loss of in-meal school sales in the springtime um, was a bit of a, a blow. And so we are going to need a year-end fund transfer of $441,960 to bring school nutrition back to a zero fund balance. So at the bottom half of page five on your financial statement, you've got the year-end status of federal grant funds as well as local and state grants and trusts. Um, not a huge amount of excitement to report there. I did want to point out that we did uh, use tech maintenance funds in FY20 to support the purchase of replacement devices for high school students. And uh, we do still have a balance in that, um, in that account to use for ongoing maintenance costs and replacement purchases. And then finally, capital improvement projects is the last page of the financial report, page six. Most CIP accounts uh, are multi-year ongoing areas of investment. Um, I wanted to call out the fact that our tech department very astutely purchased high school and K2 student devices in the winter of uh, 2020, in January, um, in perfect time for those to come in and be deployed to our students as they had to all walk out the door. Um, and that was, that was quite an operation as well. You probably remember the stories of distribution of a laptop device to every kid in the town, pretty exciting. Um, and then the Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill modulars were the big projects. They've been completed. Um, I think we got our occupancy certificate for Pleasant Hill just in the last two weeks. I'm losing track of time a little bit, but, but that was our, our big project. And then the HVAC repairs at the middle school are another big ticket item that's been ongoing. Um, and, you know, as, as far as the rest of our capital projects are concerned, you, you look at the accounts and there are those ongoing incremental repair and replacement accounts for existing infrastructure. But we do have um, still on the horizon long range planning for upgraded facilities. And, you know, we, we continue to have that as a priority. Um, even in this crazy environment, which we're trying to navigate, we stu still do need to look forward to town growth and, and development and, and try to recall that we have some uh, challenges to face there as well. So this slide is the action items. Um, I think Sarah's gonna do the the honors and read the motions for us. I tried not to give her quite as many numbers as she has to do in the budget development process. There's only, only a couple of numbers on here because it's late, Sarah. Thanks, Kate. Uh, before I do that, I just, did anyone have questions for Kate? Yeah, absolutely. It's not a question, but Kate, thank you. Um, this was a lot of work. Um, I appreciate how thoroughly you've covered everything in here. Um, as always, much appreciated. Um, should I try to share the um, budget transfer document, do you think? Would that be helpful? I mean, you guys all have it. I don't know if we have spectators, but we can, we'll also post it. I think we can post it um, unless Sarah, you'd like to see it um, shared. That's fine. Okay. No. All right. Hillary, your hand is up. Um, I didn't know if you had a question or if um, that was a holdover from the conversation. I just like to keep my hand up at all times. Just Hillary, like, Hillary oh, just oh, making oh. sure, just, just in case. <laughs> 
um, move approval to authorize budget transfers for accounts overspent by more than ten thousand dollars per details provided to the school board by the business office. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Ready to vote? Ms. Jurgen? Yes. Ms. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Okay, and move approval to transfer for $441,960 from general fund year end ba fund balance to cover the school nutrition fund de deficit. So moved. Second. And discussion? Ready to vote? Ms. Bergen? Yes. Mrs. Giptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Six point six. All right. Okay, 6.6 uh, .6 is our appointments. 6.6.1, .6 Maine School Board Associate Association Delegate. We also need to have an alternate. Um, April, thank you for volunteering so kindly. Um, as a little concerned, there'd be a little voluntold happening. Um, so motion to um, appoint April as the delegate for the conference. Well, no offense to April, but is there anyone else who wants to do it? Oh, thank you, Hillary. Is there anyone else who's interested? I mean, not me, but I think I was just gonna say <laughs> I, think I think Hillary should choose as your parting uh, <laughs> gift to us. You guys, it's all so fascinating. Like it is, it is tedious. Like I would not. I mean, it is. It's so tedious. I have no but doubt that it's just, really. <laughs> it's so interesting. I I am very proud and happy if y'all want me to do it again. I'm very excited about it. No one would want to take that away from you. <laughs> I was gonna say she jumped right in before and kind of like was very excited. I, I, I do. This is not voluntold. I'm, I'm a happy and willing volunteer. <laughs> right. So moved. Second. Ready to vote. Ms. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. She's nodding. We'll take that. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Um, and now we need somebody to volunteer as an alternate just in case April is unable to attend. Should she be unable to fulfill her responsibilities as our delegate, I would be happy to step in with the Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? All right. Motion to have Nick be our um, alternate for the MSMA conference. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And we can vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? 
Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, 662, which is the high school club advisors, and 663, middle school club advisors. I'd like to put those together. Uh, motion to approve as presented in the packet. So moved. Second. And we can vote. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Miss Layton? Yes. Mrs. Either? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. All right. Um, before I move to adjournment, um, I do want to recognize that this is the last meeting before the elections. Um, and Hillary, thank you so much. Um, I'm already starting to get a little like choked up. Um, I can't say enough to thank you for all that you've done through the three years. Uh, you have changed so many things within the district. You have brought so many improvements. So thank you for all of your service. Thank you. I had something I just wanted to say really quickly. I do have a few more committee meetings, but um, as you just mentioned, this is my last board meeting since I decided not to seek um, a second term. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone I've worked with um, over the past three years. I learned so much and I will miss collaborating with all the other board members and all the admin and central office and teachers and students. Um, I just, I can honestly say that all of the members of this board, everyone here are so highly dedicated to the well-being of our school community. And while we don't always agree, I respect all of you and all the hours of hard work that you put into your role as board members. And I wanna say a special thank you to Leanne. No one could argue that the last three years were uneventful, but I have been so lucky to ride the roller coaster with you, not only as a colleague, but as a friend as well. And thank you for being chair for the past two years. I so appreciate your time, hard work and attention to detail, but mostly I appreciate that I didn't have to do it. Um, and lastly, uh, as you mentioned, we have a big election coming up and I just wanna encourage everybody to vote. Don't forget to vote. But thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> wow. With that, I do wanna thank everyone for um, trusting me as chair for the last two years. It's been an honor. Um, hopefully I'll see you in a few weeks. Um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? We should probably just say that we're not doing a big thank you to Leanne because we're hopeful that you're gonna be sitting right here with us in a couple of weeks. Should that not be the case, after we go on a tear through the town, we'll give you a public <laughs> thank you at our next meeting, but I don't think that's gonna happen here. Do you think our motion to, to adjourn should come from Hillary? So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Second. Miss Durgan? Yep. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? I'm surprised she hasn't signed off yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Miss Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Hill. Thank you.